more people joining us. Uh, I think you just heard the message that recording is in progress. Um, so as long as you uh, are fine with that, it's a way that we can actually capture this conversation and then share it. We'll also be capturing the chat to share with everyone. Um, and we encourage you to use the chat to um, write any questions you may have, remarks, resources. So really we can use it as um, what we hope is something that can help everyone uh, starting today and far into the future. So welcome everyone to the International Humanistic Management Association Necessary Conversation Forum. Uh, we welcome today, Dr. Mary Gentili for giving voice to values, the how of values driven leadership. Um, today's conversation is sponsored by the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility in the Manning School of Business at UMass Lowell, and it's hosted by the Center for Humanistic Management at Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University. It is also an initiative we're very proud of, of the United Nations Prime Working Group on Humanistic Management, so we encourage all of you to check that out as well. Um, again, just briefly on the Zoom logistics, we are recording it. Please keep your microphone muted. We'll try to do the same for you. Um, for posing questions, remarks, resources, uh, please do go ahead and use the chat. And when Mary's um, remarks have wrapped up, she's gonna spend probably about 30 minutes presenting. Uh, we will then use the chat to moderate conversation Q&A. Um, yes, we will make the recordings available and we extend our warm welcome. So stay tuned in the chat. I will be uh, pasting some information as well as upcoming events. I will also be pasting this introduction of Mary, which I'm finally getting to. And again, we're so, so very pleased to have Mary with us today. Um, she's the creator and director of Giving Voice to Values. Welcome, Mary. She launched this initiative at the Aspen Institute and Yale School of Management, which was also hosted at Babson College for six years, and it's now based at UVA Darden. Um, it's a pioneering curriculum for values-driven leadership, and it's been featured many in many, many, many um, places, such as the Financial Times, Harvard Business Review, Stanford Social Innovation Review, McKinsey Quarterly, and so on. Uh, Mary's a consultant, speaker, and author on Giving Voice to Values, also known as GVV, and was formerly the Richard M. Waitzer Bicentennial Professor of Ethics at UVA Darden, uh, which she just uh, wrapped up into 2022, so congratulations. She was previously also at Harvard Business School. She has many awards and recognitions uh, to her name, and very well earned. I will be posting those in the chat, but just a, just a teaser, she has been inducted into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame as recently as 2021 and shortlisted for the Thinkers 50 Ideas into Practice Award as well. Um, again, I'll post some more information in the chat. Mary, welcome. Uh, we're so pleased to have you today. I'm going to turn it right over to you. Thank you so much, Erica. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be able to share Giving Voice to Values, GVV, um, with all of you today. I see some familiar names, which is fun, and I also see a lot of new names. Um, I'm going to give, um, as Erica said, a, a kind of quick overview of what GVV is in, in 30 minutes or so. There's a lot more that, that I'd be happy to share with you. So any of you who are intrigued or curious or would like to learn more, I know Erica's put in a link in the chat with a little two-page overview that has links to all the resources, the curriculum, the book series, the videos, the MOOCs, et cetera, et cetera. And you should also, my email's in there. You should also feel free to be in touch. So I'm going to try and go fast and give you a quick overview so that we have a chance to have some questions. My plan is to tell you uh, briefly what Giving Voice to Values is, a little bit about the why I created it and the research it's based on and how and why it works, and, and then try and, and conclude with a, a bit about some of the new applications um, that were, or newer applications that we've been working on recently with the hope that some of that might trigger some questions and interests depending on what your interests are and depending on where you work and what you teach and, and all of that. So to begin with, just as, as Erica said, giving voice to values is a it's an innovative approach to values driven leadership development. Um, I always tell people that if you miss what I'm saying, the main thing, the bottom line, the main thing to remember is that giving voice to values is about asking and answering a new question when it comes to um, helping people to understand and act on their values and their ethics effectively. So the typical question that we tend to ask and try to answer is, 
what is the right thing to do in any particular situation? That's a good question. It's an important question. It's one that you know people have been teaching about and researching about and talking about forever. Um, and, and that's good and that's necessary. But giving voice to values is about uh, a different question. It's about asking and answering the question, once you know what you believe the right thing to do is, how could you get it done effectively? What would you need to say and do? What kinds of data might you need to gather? Who do you need to talk to? In what sequence? And what kind of pushback or objections might you encounter? In GVV parlance, we call those the reasons and rationalizations. What are you likely to encounter? And when you do, what, what would you say and do back? What kinds of arguments, what kind of data, what kinds of reframing of the challenge might be necessary in order to have the impact that you want? And is this a one-on-one -on -one conversation or is it something where you need to gather a set of allies, a kind of coalition? And is this a one-off situation where you need to just you know, influence someone around one decision, or are you really talking about a systemic challenge? And if you're talking about a systemic challenge, it needs to be addressed systemically. What I often found both in organizations and in educational settings is that once you identify something as a systemic challenge, too often people then say, well, so I'm off the hook. <laughs> you know, it's beyond any individual actions. And yet, if you look at systemic change, it only happens through individual action. It's just that it has to be more long-term, often more incremental, um, a lot more of a, of a process of, of, of group activity and so on. So GVV, Giving Voice to Values, is about all of those questions. It's about asking and answering all of those questions. It's about action. And I tell people that it frankly grew out of my own frustration teaching ethics classes in business schools and, and, and also talking about ethics in businesses and other organizations. And it was this, it, we tended to talk about this as if it was all cognitive, as if it was all about decision making and not really about implementation, as if it was about rules, but no tools. Um, I actually, I, I tend to, to call this kind of a, the, the, it's like a black box, you know, if we, we would always say, if we can only have the decision-making framework, the appropriate code of conduct, set of rules, guidelines, and this decision-making framework, and all the data would go in one side and the right answer would come out the other side and then we're done. And it was as if the only problem was deciding what was right. And yet, so often people, a lot of people, not in every circumstance, there are more challenging or confusing situations, but in a lot of situations situations, and in some of the, the most egregious situations, there are a lot of people who actually know something's wrong. They just don't think there's any possibility for action. Um, as I call it the preach and pretend method. We preach to you about what's right and then we pretend that we can do it. Um, and so that was the frustration for me. I felt like this isn't really helping. And there were a lot of reasons why I felt it wasn't helping and why I had this kind of crisis of faith. I began to think that maybe it was futile at best and perhaps hypocritical um, to try and teach about these things in organizational and academic settings. And there were many reasons for that I won't go into because I want to go through this quickly, but I think the biggest one is what I actually saw in the classroom or in the organizational training setting. And it was this, that whenever we tried to raise these issues around values or ethics, typically we would share some case studies, some scenarios, some thorny ethical challenge. And people might read this and they might come into the conversation with an idea of what they thought the right thing, the appropriate thing, the ethical thing to do was. But then in the course of the conversation, two things would happen. The first thing that would happen is that people's thinking would become more complex. Um, they begin to realize, you know, maybe, maybe I don't have all the information. And maybe this is actually standard operating procedure in this industry or this organization or this part of the world. And maybe if I try and do something, um, I'm not likely to be effective. I may even make things worse. Um, you know, and, and all of those things would, would make people think a little more complexly and realize that, you know, maybe their going in assumptions weren't that, weren't that, weren't sufficient. And I actually think that's a good thing. You don't want people to walk into these situations naively. But the second thing that tended to happen was more troubling to me. Um, I don't know if you have this experience in your organizations or in your teaching settings, but typically when we would raise these issues around values and ethics, 
um, there would be a few people in the room who were the the ones that everybody would listen to when they were when they spoke. You know, they might be the ones who were the most articulate, the ones who could express a really complex idea in a very clear and pithy way. They might have a, an amusing anecdote to illustrate all their points, but whatever it was, those people, the ones that everyone listened to, were typically the ones who would be, they were often you know, the more confident ones, and they were typically the ones who would be raising their hands and saying, Mary, I know what you want me to say. But in the real world, this just isn't possible. Um, and so I began to feel that the folks that everyone listened to were the ones who were saying, you know, the most skeptical, if not cynical positions. Um, and so I felt that people were walking out of these conversations both more confused and less empowered. And it felt to me you know, that really wasn't my agenda here, you know, um, I felt like, is this really the best we can do? And I thought, you know, life is short, we want to do something that matters. I think I need to find a different way to, uh, to use my gifts, right? So I, I did, I actually took a step back from doing this kind of teaching for a while. And, and I had a number of experiences, I won't go through all of them now, um, in the interest of time. But Primarily what they did is that they led me to um, begin to do some exploration in two different directions. I gathered, I started to gather stories. I started to interview people um, at every level in organizations and to ask them about a time when they had experienced values conflicts, ethical conflicts, and how they'd handled it. And I gathered stories both of people who had acted effectively on their values and people who had either failed to act or tried and failed. Um, and the other kinds of exploration I did was I began to look at the research this was about 12, 15 years ago, and there was starting to be a lot of research in a number of disciplines that was suggesting a new approach to trying to have an impact on people's values-driven behaviors. There's actually more of this research now. The, the first studies that kind of triggered this thought for me were two different um, qualitative studies done by two different scholars independently, Douglas Hunnicke and Perry London. And they both decided they wanted to explore the question of, um, people who act with great moral conviction in times of very high stakes, very high risk. And they both decided independently that they would do these in-depth interviews with the, a population that's often referred to as rescuers from World War II. So these are people who put their own lives at stake during the Holocaust to help others who were at risk. And they did you know, these in-depth interviews and as with qualitative research, they tended to find a number of characteristics that these people tended to share. The one that really stuck with me and resonated with me, probably because I was an educator, was that they said that the people who acted with this kind of conviction in these high risk situations all reported that at an earlier point in their lives, usually as a young adult, they had had the experience with someone more senior to them. So um, a boss, a mentor, a teacher, even a parent, they'd had the experience of, of um, that person asking them, you know, what would you do if, and then proffering certain kinds of values conflicts. And, and then they would have this experience of, of um, uh, answering the question to this person who stood in as proxy for the kind of person that they would need to speak with in the actual circumstances. And they, they had this experience at both the cognitive level, but also at the behavioral level. So at the cognitive level, you know, they couldn't anticipate the Holocaust, but they were having the experience of naming the value or values that mattered to them and putting words to it, a kind of script and articulation. And at the behavioral level, they were having the experience of literally voicing it out loud to this person who was more senior to them, as I said, who stood in as proxy for the persons that they might need to speak with in those circumstances. So I thought this idea of pre-scripting and rehearsal and coaching, even peer coaching, was kind of interesting. So we started to look at other research, and that's where some of the research I was mentioning earlier came in. There was starting to be a lot of research in the field of psychology, uh, as well as the neurosciences, et cetera, that was suggesting that if you really want to have an impact on people's behavior, 
that uh, rehearsal and pre-scripting and peer coaching, develop, developing this kind of what I call a moral muscle memory, a habit, a new habit, was really um, effective. So in the field of psychology, um, there's been research I'm sure you've seen around habit formation. Um, and there's also the folks who study positive deviance. You know, they study people who deviate from the norm, but in a positive direction. They have a very nice phrase. This is their phrase, not mind, but they say if you want to have an impact on people's behavior, rather than asking them to think their way into a different way of acting, it's more impactful to have them act their way into a different way of thinking. So I thought, well, that was kind of intriguing. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of the research, uh, or at least the popularization of, of cognitive neurosciences research these days around brain plasticity and around creating new neural pathways, people like Antonio Damasio. But the research I want to share with you, just because it's, a, it's I think, a very uh, kind of quick and, and, and memorable story, comes from the field of kinesthetics or the study of physical movement. So I'll just share a little story. Back in the day when I was first went to work at Harvard Business School, I decided that I needed to take a self-defense class. <laughs> I think it might be related to going to work at HBS, but at any rate, I looked around Boston and there were a lot of these courses. Some of you may have taken them. They teach pretty much the same thing. They teach you the physical moves, which are like fist to bridge of nose and heel to instep or knee to groin. And you practice these moves in the air. And the idea is that and if anyone ever attacks me, I know what to do, right? But there was one class that was different. It was called model mugging. <laughs> and it was a developmental model. So they would teach you all those moves and you'd rehearse them in the air. But then once you knew the moves, they'd bring in a gentleman in a padded suit, sort of like the Michelin man, if you remember those ads. And we would uh, stand up all in a line and take turns being attacked by this gentleman who could use these moves on us and we could use the moves we had just learned on him because he was protected. And in the beginning, it was kind of ludicrous because you just waited your turn to get attacked. But as the class went on week after week, um, you know, I might be talking to you over here and he would come and grab me. I would never know when. I would never know what hold he was going to use. And they explained to us that this was based on this research. Um, it's, it's called specific state muscle memory. Those of you who are athletes will be familiar with this. And the idea is that if you rehearse something in the physiological and cognitive and emotional state that you'll be in when you need to use it, that even if you freeze in that moment, your body remembers, right? So the tennis pro practices her serve over and over before she goes to the tournament. So when she's there under all that pressure, her body just naturally assumes the proper form. So one day I'm in this class and I'm lying on my back on the floor because I've failed to protect myself when the guy attacked me. And I was thinking, could you create a kind of moral muscle memory? Could you create a default to voice? Sure. I'm sorry, did someone say something? Sure. Uh, I'll keep going. <laughs> uh, could you create a kind of uh, default to voice and action, um, a default to informed voice? Um, because what I was learning from all these stories I was gathering from the people that I interviewed is that the kinds of objections, the kinds of pushback or resistance that they face when they try to act on their values, um, many of it, much of it was quite predictable. Um, you know, we identified the kinds of arguments that you tended to hear most frequently, and they were powerful. We call them the reasons and rationalizations, uh, but they were not bulletproof. But the idea is it's very difficult to respond to them in the moment if you haven't actually rehearsed and practiced and thought through them in advance. And so a lot of what we did was to identify this kind of pushback and then identify the kinds of enablers, the kinds of tools, the kinds of persuasive um, reframes and arguments um, and, and examples of how people could act on their values in these situations. The idea being that we're not encouraging people to just 
you know, shake their fist and stamp their foot and speak truth to power. But, you know, it's not really about whistleblowing. It's really about trying to change the conversation within the organization. Not that whistleblowing isn't sometimes necessary, but what we're trying to do is enable people to voice and act on their values before an organization has gotten to that point. Because we all know from the research and from experience that when it gets to the point where whistleblowing is your only option, it's a pretty costly thing for everyone involved. And so what we're really trying to do is change that, that conversation um, within the organization and to give people this sense of efficacy. So I thought, okay, this idea of prescripting, peer coaching, practicing, rehearsal. And then I took a look at what we actually do in the classroom, you know, and we end in training. And we tend to focus on building awareness, you know, share the kinds of situations you might encounter. To, we tend to focus on teaching analysis, where we give people scenarios and then we give them in academic setting models of ethical reasoning, in corporate settings, uh, codes of conduct or, or relevant laws and regulations. And we ask people to consider, is this over the line or not? Now, these are important things to do, but we tend to stop there. And if you stop there, unfortunately, this can sometimes lead to a sort of schooling for sophistry because people learn to be able to rationalize and defend and argue in support of just about anything. Um, and so what we really wanted to do was take it to the next, the third A or action and develop a pedagogy for that. So then again, you know, we took a look at the research and we decided, you know, we needed to create a different kind of teaching technology. And in, in, in my case, a different kind of scenario or case study. So we developed what we call the giving voice to values thought experiment. These were cases. They tended to be short. They featured people at every level in an organization, not just the CEO as the Harvard cases typically did, because people encounter these situations all the time, right away. You don't have to be the leader of the organization. But the big difference with our scenarios is that they were what one dean called post-decision making. In other words, they ended with a protagonist who knew what he or she believed the right thing to do was. And the question was, how could they get it done effectively? And then we developed a set of tools, a protocol of questions, a set of frameworks to begin to think through that process. Um, and what students were actually doing, or corporates, if we were using it in an organization, is they were literally working with each other to create the scripts and the action plans that they believed might be effective in these situations. Um, this was based on a lot of research. The, the research that really triggered this initially was um, you know, some of the behavioral ethics research that suggested that when we encounter values conflicts, we don't typically tend to sit down and do a pro and con list or to ask what would John Rawls say or what would Aristotle say. We more often tend to react automatically, emotionally, even unconsciously to do what we think is possible. And we tend to rationalize post hoc why it was the right thing to do, an okay thing to do, or maybe the only thing that we could do. And it's not that we're trying, setting out to be evil. It, this is a self-protective measure so that we don't have to live in that space of cognitive dissonance when you know something's wrong and you do it anyways. And so if we do these, if we develop cases where we just ask people, what would you do? In a way, you're just reinforcing that automatic response as I described with those very articulate people in my classes who would you know, argue for um, perhaps a less than ethical answer. And so what, what we decided is that we wanted to literally rewire that automatic response. And so we don't ask, what would you do? Instead, we ask, what if you were this person, this protagonist in the scenario who has already decided what he or she thinks is right? How could they get it done effectively? So now the way you show you're smart, the way you show you're sophisticated and a good problem solver is by figuring out the way to do the thing that everyone says is so difficult to do. And the idea is you're using the skills and the tools from all your other disciplines, but you're applying them and you're using the language of the discipline that the scenario um, addresses. In fact, GVB was originally created as a way to raise these issues, not in an ethics class, but in a marketing class or in a finance class or in an economics class. It's one of the things I, I love is when people use it in those contexts. In fact, one of the disciplines that's used it the most and has done some of the most research about the positive impacts of this approach is the field of accounting. Um, and so we, we enabled people 
able to begin to use these scenarios. We created hundreds of pieces of material. They're all based on real situations, almost always disguised. We also developed, um, in addition to these cases and teaching notes, many of which, most of them are available for free, but we also developed, you know, there's a MOOC on Coursera and there's other MOOCs that use this approach and there's a book series that applies it to different professions. Um, and so we created all these materials, exercises, readings, et cetera, the core book on giving voice to values. And we just invited people to experiment with it. And the pickup has been really um, surprising to us. It's actually now been shared on all seven continents, even the Antarctic. Um, although originally I thought it was just for graduate business schools, it's now being used in undergraduate and executive education. And many companies have come to us and started to use it as well as some NGOs. We've worked with the IEA in Europe. We've worked with the United Nations. We've have worked with a number of, of corporations around the world. Most recently, we've been working a lot with KPMG. Um, and, and we've also now started to see it cross professions. Um, and so we've begun to work with professionals in law, for example. Um, we've been actually doing some work with Villanova Law School, for example. Um, and we've shared it with different groups of lawyers. We've begun to work with the Aspen Ethical Leadership Program in healthcare, which works with physicians and chief medical officers and nurses to apply this methodology to current challenges in the field of healthcare. Um, we've begun to actually to do work with engineering. Um, the University of Virginia School of Engineering worked with me to adapt the MOOC that we had developed um, on GVV to apply it to engineering. And they have now are using it with all of their undergraduate engineering students to get effect. And that's also been made available for free globally on the online ethics center, which was originally supported by the NSF. Um, and, and then, you know, we've also begun to use it in, in so many different contexts. We've done a lot of work in Africa, for example, with the Chasey University. We're working right now with the MasterCard Foundation and all of their programs around Africa. We've had some really interesting experiences using this in different cultures, and I thought that might be interesting for our Q&A after, um, after I conclude, which I am about to do. Um, but I think you've probably figured out by now that giving voice to value is a really just a reframe. Um, instead of asking what's right, we ask, how do you get the right thing done? And we invite people to build that muscle memory and to give them that permission to think in that way. Um, and I like to tell people, and I, I like to conclude with this, is that um, we can we uh, tell people that giving voice to values is based on the three giving voice to values reversals, or the three GVV flips. We've reversed what it is we're talking about when we talk about values and ethics in our organizations. We've reversed who we think we're talking to, and we've reversed how we have that conversation. So in terms of what it is we're talking about, it used to be that um, you know most people would say to me, if you really want to talk about ethics in business, Mary, don't focus on the, the so-called clear-cut, so-called black and white issues. Those are easy. You should focus on the gray issues. Those are the ones that are really challenging. And I used to think, yeah, that makes sense. But I actually have changed my mind. Of course, there are a lot of gray issues. Um, and, and I don't know what the right answer is to all of those issues. But those are typically issues where reasonable people of goodwill and intelligence can legitimately disagree. That's, that's why they're gray. But nevertheless, there are a lot of issues where most of us, not everybody, but most of us would agree, well, that's clearly illegal or that's clearly fraudulent or that's clearly abusive. But just because most of us may, may agree with that does not mean that we feel it's possible to do anything about it. And in fact, I remember working with a gentleman as part of the US Army one time where they wanted to build some of this into their training. And you know, we were concluding that it seemed that the more people felt it was impossible to act on their values, the more they tended to frame them as gray because it becomes a way of kind of letting yourself off the hook, you know, uh, not, not, not conscious choice, but, you know, that's our, our natural reaction. And so we tend to focus on the more clear cut issues, because if we focus on those gray issues, we never get past the conversation about how many angels dance on the head of a pin and we want to get to action. And so we focus on those more clear cut issues and we don't ask you, 
you know, what would you do? We ask, what if you were this person who has decided this is what they believe the right thing to do is? How could you get it done effectively? Again, remember, we're trying to rewire that automatic connection and create a new muscle memory. So that's the first flip. And what we found is people get better at doing this. They get better at talking about the gray issues too. <laughs> and then the second flip is who we think we're talking to. Um, it used to be I'd walk into a classroom or an organization and they might say, Mary, most of the people here are good people. We just have a few bad apples. And those are the ones this is for. But I actually think of the audience differently. This is based on some research by the late Greg Dees and Peter Crampton. When we think of the, orga the organization or the classroom as a bell curve, and at one tail, bell, tail end of the bell curve, we premise are the folks who would self-identify as opportunists. And these are the, we would define opportunists as the people who would say, I will always try and maximize my material self-interest, regardless of values. Now, nobody falls into one of these categories all the time, but these are people who, if they were honest, would say that's their primary motivation. And at the other tail end of the bell curve are the folks who might self-identify as idealists. And we would define idealists as people who would say, I will always try and act on my values, regardless of the impact on my self-interest. What we premise is that the majority of us fall under the bell. I put myself there. And we call them pragmatists. And we define pragmatists as people who would say, I would like to act on my values as long as it doesn't put me at a systematic disadvantage. Now, that's not the same as saying as long as I know I'll succeed. It's not the same as saying as long as I know I'll never pay a price. It simply means I think I have a shot. Now, if you think of your audience that way, I don't believe I have the power to change the opportunists. I think some of them will always be with us. And I'm not as worried about the idealists, except I want them to be more skillful, more competent. But we're really focusing on those pragmatists. And we're saying we want to give you the skills. We want to give you the literal scripts. We want to give you the positive examples, the rehearsal, the practice, the peer coaching to be who you already want to be at your best. We're not trying to change you. It's not about thou shalt not. It's about enabling you. And our premise is that if enough of the pragmatists and the idealists become more skillful at this and more confident and comfortable at doing this, more successful, it changes the water that the opportunists are swimming in because the, you know, the calculus that they do to determine what's in their own self-interest has to change because they can't rely on the same level of silent complicity. So that's the second flip. And the final flip is how we do all this. And I've already explained that to you. Instead of focusing on what is the right thing to do, we focus on what if, what if you were this person who has decided this is what they want to do, how can they get it done effectively? And we give people the opportunity to create the literal scripts and action plans and to rehearse and peer coach around those. So that's GVV in a very quick nutshell. There's a lot more I could share with you. There's seven pillars. There's all kinds of stuff. But I'm going to pause there so we have time for um, a good discussion. And I really appreciate and thank you all for the chance to, uh, to share this with you today. Thank you, Mary. Um, I, there's always something new and insightful. Um, and I've been to many of your talks. So I, I just love the um, really just the sense of, I, for me, hope. Um, that there's a way forward and that we can be teaching this um, both in organizations and in our classrooms. So we have a few questions and I encourage everyone to add their questions to the chat. That's how we'll um, proceed with the Q&A. Why don't we start with Ravi, whose question was first. Do you wanna unmute Ravi and ask your question? Uh, yes, I, I really like the basic uh, premise that you presented in your question. What's the right uh, decision to take in a given context and uh, i really like your spiel and guidance uh, uh, but i see that as uh, throwing the whole responsibility to the shoulders of a given individual mm. uh, you be sincere and one of the uh, attendees cliff hurst also pointed out uh, to hartman's uh, website where he says the same thing you do what you believe in be sincere, be honest, be, uh, you know, uh, be guided by your values and so forth. So I have no problem with all this uh, guidance. Uh, but the issue I have is you're throwing the whole onus, the responsibility onto the shoulders of individuals. Mm. Uh, my question is more about consensual decision making. 
And whenever you bring a collectivity of people to make a decision, obviously, since individuals are pretty unique, they, uh, it raises a question. What point of view, what values, what individuals uh, 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 reasons or rationalizations, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. should uh, really guide the consensual collective level decision making. And that's not at all addressed in either the GVV perspective or what Cliff Hurst was saying or Robert Hartman is saying that. How do you move from individual to collective level? Right. Thank you, Ravi. That's a great, great question. And it's one that comes up a lot. And if you might recall, in the beginning of my remarks, when I was kind of giving the shorthand, the bottom line, what to remember, you know, and I said it was about, you know, asking a new question. And one of the things I talked about is how there are those situations that really are individual choices. You know, your boss is telling you to do something, you have to figure out how to influence him or her. And we have many examples of that. But there are also examples that, are, as I referred to them, are more systemic. And systemic can be an organization you know, that this is kind of the norm within this organization, or it's the norm of the leadership of the organization. It can be systemic in an industry. It can be systemic in a culture or in a country. Um, and those issues are issues that one individual is not going to be able to, you know, make the change. But giving voice to values doesn't suggest that it has to be one individual. What we're suggesting is that the only way change happens is when individuals act. But when you're confronting those kinds of systemic challenges, it's going to need more than one individual. It's going to need thinking more long term. It's going to need thinking more incrementally. It's going to mean engaging others, as you say, a collective action in the process. And so we've actually got some cases. In fact, I think the, the cases that probably go at this most directly were some of the cases we have in, uh, in international contexts where um, organizations went into different areas, regions, there's one called not an option even to consider, for example, where they were going into different parts of the world where, for example, in order to gain access to operate, license to operate from the government, there were all kinds of pressures to pay, bri pay bribes, but it was against the particular companies policies to do that, not to mention against the law where the countries were, where the companies were based. And so the individuals who were engaged in this realized that they couldn't change this all by themselves. This was a, 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 um, a kind of norm in that context. Um, but they ended up, uh, for example, the case I'm talking about, this individual who was the country manager for this company, he ended up developing a very complex set of uh, carrots and sticks, you know, where there were some coalitions he built in order to, between his, some of their competitors to create pressures on this particular region. And then there were also some incentives that he developed by building relationships with government officers within that, within that country. And between this sort of sophisticated dance, they were able to, in fact, be quite successful. Um, and he had the same individual who I am still in touch with has repeated this practice in, in other countries. Um, and we have another set of cases. We were actually funded a number of years ago by the United Nations Global Compact Prime to develop a set of cases on anti-corruption. And we worked in coalition with a group of faculty. It happened to be faculty in India, actually, who all wrote cases about companies um, and, and managers and in others in, in India who were confronting different forms of, of, of corruption or other sorts of unethical behavior who found ways to act. But in all of those cases, it wasn't an individual. They had to, in fact, uh, you know, work collectively and build allies. And that's part of what GVB is about, rather than saying, this is, you know, I often would hear, I don't know if you hear this, Ravi, but I often hear in the classroom, students will say, well, I couldn't do anything until I get to be CEO, <laughs> you know, and I always used to think, well, number one, that means they all assume they're going to be CEO, which, you know, is a little bit arrogant. Um, but on the other hand, it's, you know, if you don't act on values until you get to be CEO, by the time you get there, you're not that same person anymore. Um, and you don't necessarily have the ability or even the clarity of vision to act. And so a lot of this is really about 
what can you do from the place that you that you sit um, and not assuming necessarily that you are going to be able to make the change. The last thing I'll say about that is I did some work in China a number of years ago, and um, it was a it was a conference of academics who taught business ethics across the mainland as well as as well as um, in Hong Kong. And after I presented my talk, um, the woman who was sort of my handler, you know, who was bilingual and, you know, because it was one of those translated talks and everything, she came to me afterwards and she said, do you know how that went? And I said, I have no idea because people had not responded very well in the, they didn't say much. And I wasn't even sure if the translation was getting through. And she said, well, actually, they all understand English and they did understand what you said. And they're very interested, but they want to talk to you offline. <laughs> they didn't want to talk in the group setting. And so would you stick around after the conference is over and some of them want to meet with you? Well, it turned out quite a few of them stuck around and we had a long conversation, several hours. And, you know, a lot of what they talked about was how do you raise these issues when you're in a very hierarchical context? And so one of the things that we talked about is that often Sometimes when you're in that kind of a position, you're not going to be the one person who goes and you know makes the change, but you may be the person who speaks to someone who speaks to someone who actually has the ear of some of the decision makers involved, or you may be the person who tries to um, lobby to get someone who you know is going to bring another perspective or another set of data into the decision making group, you may not be the one to do it. So a lot of times people hear giving voice to values and they think it's about this, you know, individual champion, and it, it's not, it's really about organizational behavior. But you don't get that without individuals taking some ownership. But anyways, that's a long answer. I hope it helps to address a little bit what you're raising, Ravi. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Lourdes's question. And then I see that David has a question. Wilson, I see your hand up. So we'll also get to you. And then I think there was another question that just came up in the chat as well. So again, we'll, we'll try to get through everybody. Uh, I'll so, try and go shorter. <laughs> no problem. So um, Lourdes actually teaches um, GVV in, in her accounting ethics class. So she has a lot of experience with it. And I think it sounds like it's been fairly successful for her. Um, she, <laughs> excuse me. She asked, what are some exciting directions where you see your work going? Oh, yeah. Well, that's fun. Thanks for asking that. Um, there's a lot of interesting things going on. Um, one thing that I'm very excited about, I know I mentioned to you a moment ago that I've been working actually for the last, I think it's over two years now with KPMG, the accounting consulting uh, firm. And we they initially approached me to do sort of online training session. They had done one with Daniel Ariely, and then they wanted to do one on giving voice to values. But the giving voice to values one sort of cat caught. And so what we did is we created something that they call the KPMG GVV Master Facilitators Program. And so in addition to the trainings that all 33,000 of the of the U.S. employees and some international went through, we created this this uh, training program. It was a, I think it was about three weeks or something. Um, and we run three cohorts so far, and I think we're probably going to do another one in the fall, where we um, ran groups of, of partners and senior managers at the firm who, who volunteered um, from the different areas of the firm, accounting, tax, um, audit, um, consulting, business processes. We ran them through a program where they were first introduced to GVV and got to practice with it a bit. And then they were asked to identify the kinds of values conflicts that were relevant to their particular area of work, whether it was audit, whether it was IT, whether it was um, DEI, you know, there were a lot of different issues. And once they identified those, they worked in teams to create GVV style post-decision making uh, cases and teaching plans or solutions. And then they had a chance to practice teaching those to each other. And I was coaching them as well. Um, and then now that those folks have sort of passed this program, they are now being asked to, um, you know, they might be asked to drop into um, um, an executive education program or a continuing ed program for the audit partners or for the tax uh, managers or whatever group. And they'll be in a program for that group and they'll teach GVV scenarios that are relevant to that function um, to those groups. And they've been kind trying to gather data about the impact of this approach. And so far, they feel that it's been quite positive. 
so where we're in the process right now, this is the exciting part, is to try and get permission, because of course it's always proprietary, but to try and get permission to write an article about the impact of this approach. And so I'm hoping that that will be happening later this year. So that's one piece that's very exciting. Another piece is that last year we got funding from the Deloitte Foundation to develop a series of GVV style cases and teaching plans around tech ethics. So they deal with things like artificial intelligence and bias and social media and ransomware um, and privacy rights, uh, facial recognition, et cetera. And I think that's been very exciting. Um, the use of it in engineering is starting to grow, which I think is is a, a very exciting piece as well. So, you know, the not just the, the global spread, but the cross-functional spread, has been very interesting and useful. And I guess the last, men there's a lot of other things, but the last one I'll mention right now is um, I've been working with the MasterCard Foundation, which although they're based in Canada, most of their work is in Africa, on the African continent in a number of countries. And we've been working with them to do something slightly similar to what we did with KPMG, where we are training a cohort, I think it's about 25 or so, because this is a smaller organization of, um, of uh, managers within the organization with GVV, and they are now then beginning to teach their colleagues um, across the continent with the approach. I just did a refresher meeting with them yesterday, and this has been probably one of the most fun groups I've worked with in a number of years because they really engaged with the ideas at, at a kind of a conceptual level, and 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 they've really gotten into it. So that's been fun. Great. Uh, David, you had a question, and then Wilson will go to you after David's question. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Mary. I've, Hi, David. About, maybe, 10 years ago, I got rid of all my ethics tests and started having them write memos. And students consistently say, I really enjoyed the memo, but <laughs> it's a lot of work on me. Uh, but that's all right, because they're also learning to write. And I mm -hmm. also have gotten... I've changed up all my lesson plans. So like I give them a business, I raise the minimum wage, they fire people. The next class I have them come up and fire me. Um, because I think, you know, what you're getting at is so true. Um, my question is, and by the way, this is a lot of this is GPT safe, right? They can't just type this in <laughs> with AI either. Yeah. Uh, but my question is about power structures and organizations. And I think you mentioned this in the China example. Um, and so how complex do you make these cases that they have to do scripts for? Because you know sometimes issues are, they last six months or a year. And sometimes you just have to leave the organization right. because it just cannot go. And um, and so that's sort of uh, the complexity. And then also, I think one of the drivers of unethical behavior that I've seen is what Ken Goodpaster calls teleopathy, which is goal disease, right? Where mm -hmm. it can be the most ethical person at home, but once someone sets a giant goal, all of a sudden you're just trying to solve a problem. And before you know it, you've created a defeat device for Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. Now you're trying to justify your action. So mm -hmm. complexity and power is sort of my, what well, well, I'd like to get your impressions on. Right. Well, those are really great, great points. In terms of the first one, on, and, and, and by the way, I just saw uh, Jim Stoner in the audience there, and I wanted to say hi. <laughs> um, but David, those are great points. So in terms of your first point about uh, complexity, we have both, you know, we have some cases that are really about an individual who has a conversation with another individual and feels is often their, their, their manager and feels pressured to do something and needs to figure out how to talk to him or her in a way to maintain their relationship, but resist the unethical behavior. So we have those kinds of cases. And we also have cases similar to the one I mentioned to Ravi, where it's much more complex. It's, you know, the country manager in, in a part of the world where in order to get licenses, in order, this was a multinational pharmaceutical, in order to get licenses for their um, prescription drugs, they needed to get approvals from the Ministry of Health. And then it also, also for their over the counter drugs, there were um, government 
subsidized or, or, or you know, licenses given to former generals who had supported the current government, um, even though the products that they were selling were um, basically, um, what do they call it? They, they were fake, <laughs> you know, they didn't have the, the, uh, the, the uh, medicine in them, even though, even though they were being sold as such. And they were in fact, you know, competing with this company. So it was very complex, you know, and the, so they had to work at both the multinational level with other, other pharmaceuticals who were often their competitors. They had to work at the legal and regulatory level, both in terms of the country where they were based and in terms of the, the country where they were trying to operate. And they had to work at the local level in terms of building relationships, both with physicians who were going to be, you know, helping to sell their product, as well as with the government that they needed to have licenses from. So we have cases at all of those different levels, partly because sometimes these are used with MBA students or executives who can work at that at complex level. And sometimes they're used with undergraduates. And, you know, we really need to have a case about, you know, being pressured to cheat, you know, and it's something much simpler. So we have uh, the whole range. In terms of your second question about goal or teleopathy, you know, and, and this kind of goal fixation, um, very much we focus on that. There's, I didn't go into it, but there's seven pillars of giving voice to values. I addressed them in the book. And one of them is purpose. And these seven pillars were basically from interviewing so many people and gathering so many stories about how people encountered and dealt with values conflicts we identified seven of the ways that people who did this effectively <laughs> tended to think about the issues. And one of them was around, I use the word purpose, you could use the word goal, but it was basically the idea that the people who did this effectively tended to define their goals or their objectives for themselves, both more broadly, more explicitly, and more long-term. And that that became a way to motivate themselves, but it also became ways to generate arguments that they used with people that they were trying to influence. Um, when I heard you describing this idea, it made me think of the old article by Dennis Joya about the Pinto fires, you know, where he came in with a set of what he thought his values were. And then when he got into the firm, the, the sort of socialization and the scripts, the internal and assumed scripts about what their goals were, you know, un, you know autumn, unconsciously kind of automatically he got absorbed into that until something shook him out of it. Um, and so I think that the idea of GVV is to give people the opportunity to do that rehearsal and practice before they're in that situation so that they have at the ready, I always talk about having more arrows in your quiver, you know, so that you don't feel the automatic necessary and unconscious response you know when we when we do the read the research about um, decision making biases and heuristics what we tend to hear is that knowing about them doesn't make you proof against them it just means you recognize it when someone else falls prey to it you know and so i think the way to make you proof against them is to actually create a new habit to give people this opportunity to, to share some of these other arguments with peers who are standing in for the kinds of people they need to talk to so that there is another kind of automatic response that you've made possible. So anyways, there's more we could say about that. Those are two really good, good points. Great. Thank you. Uh, Wilson, I see your hand up. It's been up for a while. Yes. Yeah, quick question. Thank you. Good presentation. Hi, Wilson. Um, Hi. What role does reward and punishment play in GVV? And, or should it play any role in GVV, <laughs> knowing that you're living in a world of what's in it for me? And would companies that are strong in the areas of GVV create better communities as a result of um, adhering to those um, value proposition. Is it to make this world a better place using the cooperation as a mechanism or where does it end? Where does it, why does it end somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of the first question about incentives, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so much research out there now. The most recent book by um, Gen Dennis Gentle in, in Australia, who's a good friend of mine, talks a lot about incentives. And there's a lot of research about, you know, when they don't work, which is a lot of the time, <laughs> um, and, and how you might 
think about trying to improve them. Dennis tends to come down on the side of incentives being the only incentives or disincentives, as I think you pointed out, being the only way to influence behavior. But I think the research suggests that that doesn't work. That's in my view um, is not enough, you know, um, because often, you know, people just find ways around it. It's like uh, you've probably seen the studies about uh, daycare where they put into place um, uh, disincentives for parents to pick up their child late. They'd have to pay a fee. And and in, so instead of people starting to come more often, I mean, come more on time, they just started to figure I'm just paying the fee in order to come late, you know, and so people find ways to work around incentives and disincentives. So I'm not saying they shouldn't be there. Obviously, they work to a certain extent for a certain population, but I think they're not enough. And what we're trying to do with GVV is give people the opportunity to um, develop more abilities, more skills to be able to address these issues more directly, which gets to your second question around building community, which is that what we find when people do these kinds of um, uh, GBB sort of exercises, it makes uh, more honest, more complete conversations more possible because people are, what we do is we enable them to, to name all the kinds of objections and rationalizations and, and uh, deterrence, um, and they can name them while they're also working together to try and find ways to address them and to counter them. And so in, rather than it becoming an exercise in platitudes, um, it gives you a chance to name the concerns without having to own them, um, you know, but also give you a chance to, to have the conversation with your peers. What we're finding is that sometimes the, the folks who would want to raise these issues are intimidated. I remember giving a talk in uh, Argentina a number of years ago, and it was not with students. It was a group of, they were students in an MBA program, but they were all already managers. They were older. They were in their mid-30s and, and, and up. And I remember that after I finished my talk about GVV, there was one gentleman whose hand went up right away and he was very combative and his 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 questions were all about, you know, well, why would someone do the right thing? And, you know, would anyone really do the right thing? And, you know, could you do the right thing and still be successful? And so I was answering his questions, but every time I answered a question and would then open it up for other questions, his hand would go right back up and he'd ask a follow-up. So we went through this several times. And so finally, I said, look, I'm happy to keep talking to you. He was the only one whose hand was up. I said, but, you know, I want to just point out that the conversation that we're having is why people don't want to talk about these issues, because you're not letting us get to the point to explore how we might do the right thing. You're simply just talking about all the reasons why we can't do the right thing. And as soon as I said that, he kind of paused for a moment because it made him shift his thinking. And in that pause, all these other hands went up. So there were other people in the room who wanted to talk about this, but they do get kind of shut out. <laughs> and so I think what, what happens with GVV is that we're enabling that conversation to happen. So um, anyways, that, that, that is certainly the intent and it's what I see when we try and have these conversations. Great. I see so many hands up and many questions in the chat that we will not get to in the next three three minutes. Um, so I'm very sorry about that, but please do add your questions to the chat and please please feel very free. I, I think I can speak on Mary's behalf to, to connect with you. Is that That's right? That's what I was going to say. Feel free to email. Okay. And I can put your email in the chat. Is that all right? Yes. And it's also in that little two-page uh, thing you attached. Great. So uh, let's go for, for one more question. And I'm again, I apologize if I don't get to, I'm just going in the order um, in the chat. So Terry, you had a question and we have two minutes. Uh, so it'll be a, a quick Q&A. Oh, Mary, I really love how you went through everything today. It cleared up a lot of things. Um, so my question was about, you have the one person standing out by himself, like Jamal Brown in New York. Who's, who's saying the TikTok, you know, conversation is hysteria, you know, around China. And then you have the one individual in the research on all who experiences all and the sign shows that they are transformed and actually taps into their spiritual core, which MRIs have, you know, they have identified areas of the brain that we have a spiritual core. So, 
my fascination in research has been how do we bring that into the classroom with the students? You know, like you were saying, someone writing and coming to an awareness and, and someone else said. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. So uh, I just to make sure I understand the question is how to bring what into the classroom? How are we tapping the spiritual core of our students? Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I, I personally don't talk in terms of uh, spirituality. Um, not that I don't think I have a spiritual side. I'm sure I do. Um, it's not really what I lead with. But I do think that a lot of what GBV is about is enabling people to to act from their deepest core. You know, what I like to tell people is that GBV, unlike often approaches to ethics, which are about a set of external rules or codes or conducts or regulations, GBV is about aspiration. It's about people understanding the values that they have that, that drive them. It's about, rather than about thou shalt not, it's more about can do, how can I be all of whom I want to be? And in my view, you know, that connects with a kind of spiritual side of our of our beings but i don't usually talk in that language so i yeah. don't know if that helps a little bit oh it's beautiful thank you it's great well thank you everyone somehow everyone managed to wrap this up exactly on time um, again huge thanks mary for joining us um really just always really a pleasure and honor to have you discuss your ideas um, thank you to everyone who joined today. I've put a number of links and resources in the chat. You are welcome to touch base with Mary. Join us for future EMA events um, and be well. Happy springtime. Okay. Great to see you all. Thank you for the opportunity.